happy to introduce your visitors that are on Zoom. And thank you very much. I'll pass over. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd like to welcome um, uh, Fred von Riednitz from ACT, uh, Dean Baird from South Arm, Gordon Goss from Geelong, and Lee Stephen Payne from, um, from Melbourne. Um, Dean's a local fly fisherman, um, and Gordon and uh, Stephen and um, Fred, I've um, built a couple, couple of rods and also repaired them on a couple of dangy rods, which I'll talk about in a sec. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, this tonight's uh, presentation is divided into two parts. I'm going to give uh, a bit of an introduction to bamboo rod making. Can you hear me all right? Yes, of course. Okay. And uh, um, Jim's going to talk about a very specialised area of the bamboo world. Which is uh, restoration. And um, let me tell you, there aren't many people that restore cane rods. It's too difficult for me. I don't go near it. Most of my mates that make cane rods on there too. So um, Jim's uh, quite unusual in that he's developed an interest in the restoration of um, vintage, vintage cane rods. So I've been uh, using making and using cane rods since 2008 when I did my uh, my. Uh, fly casting instructor for CCR tested my fly casting instructor's certificate and I met up with uh, Nick Karansky who was doing his certificate at the same time using the cane rod. So really I think that's probably where I developed a great interest in it and uh, after talking to Nick um, I ended up uh, going to America, I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, to learn how to make them. So about 90% of the time, I reckon I use cane rods. I've got some beautiful graphite rods that I use, a lot of sage rods I still use. And uh, for some uh, for some situations, I don't think you can be at a nine foot, six weight on a windy day, charting on the Great Lakes, putting a um, graphite rod. But uh, for most of my fishing, I get more pleasure out of using a cane rod. And um, I'd like to talk to you a bit about uh, why. So the material has been around for a long time. From uh, uh, the Americans uh, will lay claim to making the first six-sided cane rods from the 1860s after the Civil War um, by a fellow called um, Samuel Philippe. A lot of these uh, makers came out of the out of the gun um, gun making or furniture making uh, area. So. Uh, I don't doubt the British will lay claim a bit later, particularly with the Hardy, but you know, my understanding is the Americans started to split cane back in the 1860s. And it, it's been the material of choice for a very long time, until probably the 60s, where an embargo on the cane that we use, which uh, is uh, Chinese, primarily Chinese cane, uh, put a stop to the supply so back in the late 60s, the embargo. And even today, they talk about pre embargo cane, post embargo cane, with the pre embargo being even more desirable. Um, and, and with the onset of uh, fiberglass, too, in the late 50s and 1960s, it superseded the material and gradually became uh, less popular. But for us, for some of us, it's never gone away. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful material to uh, fish with. And the reason why. Uh, I like fishing with bamboo rods, probably three primary primary reasons. Um, and I'm sure you have your own favorite rods. And I'll bet you that if I ask you why you like them, then a lot of the answer will be because they feel good. You either like the way they feel or the way they cast or the way they fish. And, and so it is with cane as well. It's uh, the feel. It's a... Uh, it's a material more from the reed family rather than timber. So it has uh, qualities, sensitive qualities, I think that modern materials can't really reproduce. Yeah. Um, bamboo rod users will say that um, when they cast it, the rod will do more work than graphite rod. I think there's something in that. And they might say that their casting is smoother or more fluid. Um, and when they, in terms, when they describe their casting, you know, they'll use a mode of terms uh, like sweet, and smooth. Whereas in my experience, the graphite rod users are more about efficiency and power and tightness as well. 
But some of us like that oily feel that the Lord gives us. Another reason why I like it is that uh, it's probably a bit of nostalgia in there. When I grew up, fly fishermen, you know, had a kind of a mystique or an aura about them. And when we saw them on the river, you know, we would stop and point them out. And uh, they just seem to have this aura. So I guess for me, there is a bit of nostalgia in using um, rods that I, that I used to see when I was a kid. And I guess the world was a little bit simpler. The fish were bigger less pressure on the rivers. So it's probably a little bit of nostalgia there. And the other reason I like it is that each rod is uh, unique. So um, the feel of the rod, even if uh, rod makers are uh, making the same model of rod, the feel will uh, vary slightly. It still feel like the same. This is a Dickinson 7612, very famous American rod. And, um, but it will, feel differently according to whether it's been uh, tempered or flamed, how much moisture is in it, um, how much error is in it from the rod maker. So we've got a lot of variables at the top of the barrels, whether two piece, three piece, four piece. Um, it'll all generally feel like a thicker than 7613, but with subtle differences. And I like that, you know, I like, I like the fact that the rods I use are unique they feel differently, and some days I might want to use this rod, and some rods I might want to use uh, in a different one. So I do have the luxury of um, having a few rods to choose from. Can I just ask, uh, just with a show of hands, how many people here have got more than five rods? <laughs> how many would have more than ten rods? Yeah. Um, <laughs> up to 20? <laughs> well, it says something about our sport, I think. Everybody because like boats, there's no perfect rod for a particular situation. You wouldn't want to use a fixed weight stiff sage, you know, um, dead axis on a on a little creek, would you? You'd want to use a three-weight circuit or a bamboo rod or a fiberglass rod or a So each have their um, different uses. Uh, there's uh, been a recent surge in popularity of cane rods. I think cane rods have been made better now than they've ever been made. We've got 150 years of uh, shared history, knowledge in making. The great rod makers of the past, uh, particularly in America, you know, the Dickersons and Paul Young and um, Paul Duke, who comes in Dickerson uh, and Young. Have left us with many, many beautiful tapers uh, that are still very functional and still made and used today. But with better, more accurate measuring materials and uh, better um, glues uh, and a very high standard of the workmanship, I don't think uh, cane rods are um, be made much better, really. And I've looked at a lot of the original, really famous original rods and uh, they say a really, really good cane rod would have five or six bolts in it. You'd have to look for them, but um, those old masters cane rods have a lot more than that. You know? Some of their workmanship is uh, is nothing like uh, as good as it is today. Um, so it's become more popular. It's more popular in America, more popular in Europe. The, uh, the Nordic countries have uh, leading the way with longer cane rods, sort of eight foot and beyond. That's a standard rod for their rivers and their type of fishing up there. Um, and, uh, and in Australia too. So uh, when I went to learn how to make rods with, by a guy in the States, where a lot of Australian guys were taught by Jeff Wagner, he's a rod maker in Ohio. Uh, many, many of the rod makers uh, here uh, learn from Jeff, and um, some of them have gone on to teach others, which I want to talk a little bit more about um, a bit later. Uh, there's a lovely literature associated with bamboo rods. Some of them are uh, rods of how to make them. Uh, this is a very famous one. A master's guide to rod building by a, an engineer, Everett Garrison. Do not read this book if you want to make cane rods. It'll put you off in forever. <laughs> a lot of other better options. It's a very dry book full of uh, mathematics.
mathematical uh, modeling. But uh, it is, they call it the Bible, but I think there are a lot of better options of uh, learning. And of course, these days, a lot of people learn online, YouTube. Um, but I don't think there's a I don't think uh, there's a better way to learn than from somebody that can make them themselves. Which leads me on to Cressy Kane. So Cressy Kane is a three day celebration of bamboo and rod making that I started with Nick Karansky and Peter Hayes in 2015. So uh, it, um, we designed it around uh, some classes that Rick wanted to, uh, Nick wanted to conduct of how to make a cane rod. So Nick has uh, three weeks of classes, four to the group of uh, how to make a cane rod. So we go through the whole process. We make a beautiful heirloom quality, uh, of outstanding quality that Nick's able to do. You know, compared to the rod I made in America, 20, 30, 40 times better quality. Um, so Nick is a master, not only a master craftsman, but a master teacher as well. Um, and at the end of those uh, three weeks, we have a, um, a celebration of rod making. And from that, we've got about 50 rod makers across the country now. Um, we've had quite a few from the club, actually. Um, made a bit of a list earlier on. Bill Luck, Simon Thompson, Tim Munro. Mark Rampant, who unfortunately just lost, Jim Jones, uh, myself, Bruce Barker, and Lucy Wilkins uh, uh, have all made hang rods or are uh, using them. Um, so during these three days, we, uh, we might have a project, um, for example. We cast a lot of rods, and one of the projects we made was um, to make this rod, 7613, but uh, slightly differently. To each other. So I made this rod out of Japanese cane and rather than a Chinese cane. And uh, I made it with a scarf ferrule. So lots of different ways of joining rods. So this is just a scarf, which is why they used to make the big bamboo spay rods, because ferrules generally will pull apart with that sort of stress on them. So it's a very old method, but still uh, very effective. So others would make that rod in two piece or three piece or four piece or with metal ferrules or with honking cane um, or uh, it's quite interesting or uh, composite ferrules. So we've got one mate of mine that actually uses fiberglass to join the spots together. Uh, so it reflects really nicely through the ferrule and, uh, and that affects the action completely nicely yeah, rather than having a stiffness through that area, the ability for that to bend and enhance the action. Similarly, the one with the scarf, but also, I won't put it together now, will also flex through that as well. It was a fantastic project. You know, we had 20 rods, 20 of the same rod that felt differently. And it's not until you cast these and think about them, I think casting cane rods does make you think about the casting and your loop shape and your presentation a bit more that uh, you start to pick up, you know, the nuances that uh, all these rods have. There's a sweet spot for cane rods, you know, up to seven foot six, certainly six foot six to seven foot six does seem to be the, the right length for that material. This produces a whole range of dozens and dozens of different types of paper that are suited to that length. Uh, my rods are getting longer, um, uh, I'm making an eight foot three piece rod at the moment, which I think will be a beautiful lake rod. Um, and uh, I've got mates that make rods longer than that and they use them. But to me, a lot of people start to get lost with the longer rods. They get a little bit slower and a little bit heavier as well. Um, if you wanted to know uh, anything about Chrissy Kane, uh, all you have to do is look at Nick Taransky's website under other, and uh, he'll uh, put a link on to pressycane.org. Lots of photos. Every second year, we bring out uh, an international rod maker. The two Japanese rod makers um, that were due to come out last year, but we of course have to suspend that. Had Jeff Wagner come out, American. We had a uh, Canadian um, 
bay rod maker that you might know through April Vokey or Bob Fay, who makes um, switch and bay rods for the for the, um, uh, the big rivers in uh, Canada. So that's a brief sort of introduction. Um, I don't really want to get bogged down in the make the process, but I will just sort of briefly go over it for those that you know don't know how we how we make them. So um, cane comes in a what's called a cool C U L N, and usually twelve foot uh, length. Um, this is a Japanese cane called Madaki, which is grown in Queensland. Um, but most of the cane we use. And of the lower modulus, this cane, it bends more compared to concrete. So we're still exploring some of the properties of that material. This is uh, Chinese cane, um, concrete cane. You can make cane rods out of anything, but this rod, this material is popular because it's grown at altitude. Uh, it can grow up to a meter a day, grown in very windy conditions. So it develops the qualities in the material that we like. So it has what we call a lot of power fibers. We've got an enamel on the outside to protect the plant. Um, and then a series of fibers that run pretty much the length of the whole whole uh, cool uh, and then a pithy useless sort of material inside as well. So we're only interested in the power fibers. And this material has a lot of power fibers, it's heavy and um, has uh, a lot of strength, has the ability to bend, but more importantly to straighten. And uh, whereas the Madaki um, still will do that, but it will do it with slower, smoother, oilier action. <laughs> <laughs> so we start with a cool, uh, we might temper it, flame it. So um, you can do that with a torch, or some people use an oven to heat it up. Um, and uh, they might flame them internally and leave them. Exterior alone, or and the sound if you like, or um, or you might flame internally and externally, or you might not flame it at all, just go with a natural material, uh, and then we start to split it. And uh, remember, this is a hexagonal uh, rod, so it's a little bit, it's a bit broken. Actually. I think it's yeah, it's broken. Can I have a look at that again? Yeah. So that's not a knife. I think I'm sure it's. So that's split beautifully. So we use a blind knife to do that. Uh, and we're able to split that uh, until uh, we're down to yeah, about a quarter of an inch uh, thickness. So that's our basic uh, piece of cane, just like this. Um, the nodes, which are the, like rings, growth rings, knots, are a real problem for cane rod makers. They don't plan very well. The cane misbehaves around them. So we don't want these points of weakness to be next to each other. So we do what we, we call stagger. So we you know we move those, move those nodes away from each other so that we, we don't have two line next to each other. And there's lots of different types of nodal staggers. That's commonly the Nodes, no nodes, 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 sort of three by three. And you don't want those nodes anywhere near a ferrule, which is a, you know, an area of maximum stress because it will, if it breaks, it'll break up at the nodes. Yeah. Uh, and then we start putting a taper. So um, to make a cane rod, you need a painting form, which is usually can be wood, but uh, most of us have got a uh, steel painting form, which is two pieces of steel with a 60 degree groove that are adjustable every five inches. And that's probably the biggest stumbling block if you want to get into cane rods, you need a planing form to do it. Yeah. And so the recipe for the rod, which is the paper from you know, the thickest of seven, six, one, three, will tell you that the cane needs to be you know, 250, 280 thousand all imperial of an inch here, 240 thousand of an inch here, 220 thousand of an inch here, and so on and so forth. And then to usually about 60 thou, I think it's about 1.2 mil at the tip, 60 thou. 
So uh, that's very fine. Get your triangle. Then we plane from from that sixty degree groove until we end up with hexagonal, six hexagonals like pencil. Glue them together. Jim, you've got a couple of banks here. Yeah, it's a little six foot two piece here. Yeah. So these are blanks. So uh, these have been flamed, 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 glued, and are ready for uh, uh, peril and for fitting the real seat. Um, so there's a, I did want to, did want to mention this section. I want to send this around. Is that, um, is that the traditional way to join cane together is did a metal ferrule, triple silver, and uh, this one here. But we've also got the fiber, fiberglass. But the other way that we're using is with a bamboo ferrule, which is more of a traditional Japanese method. So this rod's got a bamboo ferrule. And uh, these bend right through that part of the rod. And I think they're beautiful. It's certainly a lot cheaper than metal ferrules, which are running at about $80 US now. So they're becoming a bit expensive. But these will take about, you know, 20 cents. <laughs> Plus a bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's traditional to, uh, to use a nice uh, real seat, just some hewn pine. And rod makers will turn these themselves. Uh, some of them will even um, some will even go on and do all of the metal work. They make the guides, they make the ferrules. Beyond me, this stuff. Um, and we'll see. How about you, Greg? Did you make any of the metal work? I make uh, brass ferrules. Yeah. Okay. Save money for the Yeah. Not as good as the Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so it is. I mean, it is an expensive element, but these these fiberglass ferrules. So there's uh, there's two ways of doing that. One's that's been done extrinsically. So I've made six little pieces, glued them together, and then glued that onto the blank. Or it can be built into the actual um, section, six sections, and then glued together. Uh, traditionally, you want something that's waterproof, UV resistant, and um, uh, boat varnishes uh, great for doing that job to seal the wire. We don't want moisture getting in there. Moisture is not good for cane. You don't want to put away a cane rod that's uh, wet. Um, but there are other ways of uh, finishing. Um, some people will use tongue, tongue oil or what's that stuff you use? True, true, oil. true oil. You know, yeah. gun makers um, uh, oil. Uh, and one method that we've been experimenting with is uh, a Gorilla Glue, you know, that stuff you buy from, uh, I don't know what sort of glue it is, I never understand what it's um, uh, to wipe on finish. So uh, it's very durable. This is, uh, I think, a very nice uh, finish. This is Gorilla Glue, so no varnish, but it's a little bit softer compared to um, uh, varnish. The thing about that rod is that it has a, um, a swell in front of the core. So if you look at it just in front, it does. Yeah. So um, that stiffens up the whole action as well. Mm. So does the varnish make any difference to the action? Lots of things do. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. You know, this is as part of Cressy Kane, we've explored a lot of those things. You would be amazed at the difference. Uh, the weight of the ferrule when a three piece rod sometimes and often enhances it. You, know? you wouldn't think that a, a small truncated ferrule in a three piece rod, which is very small, would make such a big difference. But it's it's like you know, a bit like a potato on a stick. You know? So uh, the different guides will make a difference. You know, a heavier weighted guide can change the action of that rod surprisingly. The glue that you use. Does that, have, that would have a major effect on the sickness of the glue that you use? Yeah, yeah. most of us use uh, epoxy. There's a few, uh, I don't know what that type on glue is. Some of the guys uh, use that. I'm using a, an epoxy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, all of it will make a difference. You know, the ferrule material, the um, weight of the guides, the number of guides as well. Yeah. 
Any other questions at this point? Some of them, the old rods have binding all the way up. To the, yeah. To the old ones. Yeah. So I'm assuming that because the fluid is weren't as good when they made those rods. Well, they're not as good. I mean, they're, uh, but you're right. So they use animal fluid primarily. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, that was to reinforce the, uh, you know, the jaw. So that it felt laminated together. Yeah. One thing I neglected to mention and uh, meant to in the function is that. You know, they for casting up to 60, 70 feet, they're a beautiful, accurate tool. But you don't have to take my word for that. So if you uh, were at the casting day for the club at Plenty, you'll remember that the dry fly, Mark Knight dry fly trophy was won by Jane with a 1930, what was it like? Philipson? Southam, South, South South um, three ounce. Um, Seven foot six. I've got it here. Yeah. So you know, it's at my rod. And I say they're accurate and beautiful for you. Um, so if there aren't any more questions at this point, uh, I just want to um, move on to you, Jim. Yeah. Um, yeah. You said there were six or seven bolts on those rods. What was the question? So you know, when a bamboo rod maker picks up a rod, uh, the first thing you look at, uh, look for, are uh, glue lines. So where those sections of rods come together, poorly made rod, you know, we'll have a black line. I'm sure you probably find one in here if you look closely enough. Um, we'll have a, a, a black line where there's a measurement, and you're talking 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 to the meter. Um, isn't quite right. So when you join them together, you know, it's just a thin line. So uh, that's that's the first thing that the rod makes that loop zero in on. Some of them would be hidden, you know, they might they might have used a bit of cane that's uh, got a blemish or uh, an old insect, an insect damage, and they've covered it up. Um, some might be in the measurement itself, so they might be to measure them, you know, compared to the original recipe. The difference is you know, 20 cent high, which isn't that much actually. But we all we do strive to get within five thousand and, and even less. So you know, an expert rod maker like Nick Ferenczi wouldn't let a rod go out of his shop unless it was a hundred percent accurate. Because maybe Nick Ferenczi's rod, if it's meant to be two hundred and forty thousand at that point, it'll be two hundred and forty thousand on each section. And you know, and that's the um, standard that we all aspire to. Mm. So, yep. um, so out of those 50 rod makers that I know, uh, only two uh, will are prepared to restore the rod. And to restore a rod faithfully to the original owner with the appropriate silks and guides, it's a very difficult job. And uh, I, I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't do it justice, really. So there are very few rod makers around that will that will restore rods. And Jim in the club is one of the few. So Jim's a fairly new, um, fairly new to the cane world. And I'm afraid he has got the virus pretty badly. But I'll let you talk about your journey then, Jim. Thanks very much, David. <clears throat> um, that, that's a um, fairly hard act to follow, really, in terms of the um, both the lineage of, of um, bamboo rods and um, and the design of rods. Um, I um, I started this caper in May last year, so I'm I'm still on my oil plates, and I'm not sitting here saying that I'm I'm making rods from from bamboo. I started off partly by accident. Um, a friend of mine um, gave me a rod ten years ago, an old um, Hardy's seven foot spinning rod called a, called a hardy wanless and um it sat in the shed for a while and he died and i i pulled the rod out i think it was during covid i might be a victim of covid here but um i pulled the rod out of the shed and had a look at it and it was a bit sad and i thought well the best thing i could do is see if i can repair it and i didn't know what i was getting myself into quite frankly um and um i didn't know anybody who um Knew much about um, bamboo rods. Uh, I, I didn't realise that um, 
I've been away from Tasmania and uh, didn't realise Cressy Kane was this national event. I didn't realise that um, um, Dave Hemmings had, um, had created it. In fact, Cressy's my, my hometown, so it was even more of a serendipity um, to, to find that out. Uh, I've been fishing, fly fishing for about 25 years. I um, was introduced to fly fishing by Noel Jetson, who um, took me out of the back of his shop one day and um, he said, I was down to a number one celter on a spinning rod and he, he said, it's time. And I was in my 40s and um, he effectively scuffed me out the back of the neck and took me out the back of the shop and showed me how to cast and I went out to the Lake River and lost a beautiful box of flies immediately up trees and got tangles and all sorts of things. But I caught a trout this the first day. And I remember um, <clears throat> in the back of his, um, his little Jeep, I think he had a little six foot bamboo rod and I just stuck in my mind. Um, so I, I, I'm an accidental um, rod builder. I, I'm not a maker and um, I'm not sure I can, I can do, start from a, a column of, um, the bamboo and, and make the tapers, but I mean it's quite extraordinary that you know you, you end up with a with a taper. Um, I think I might pass them around. But you know this, this stick of bamboo is made up out of six pieces, six pieces of, of bamboo, and, it, and it's you know it's a very beautifully um, made structure in terms of its um, its bending moment to the point where it breaks. And um, I had a um, happened upon a six pound um, trout at Lake Leak a couple of weeks ago on a lovely, um, lovely old um, sharks rod I bought in England um, recently, a seven foot five weight. And I just took it out for a bit of a, for a bit of a test cast. And um, as soon as this trout saw the, saw it was a bamboo rod, it gave up immediately. So it was, it was hooked and so was I. So I'll pass that rod around. It's a lovely little um, 60, year old, 60 year old fly rod, still as good as the day it was built. So part of the part of the inspiration, I think, is is the difficulty of, of fixing graphite. It's very hard to fix graphite rods. I've got a um, Noel sold me a four four piece kill rod, my second rod, uh, and it's starting to sort of fall apart. And it's um, twenty five years old, um, <clears throat> has to be resprayed, and um, I'll probably get around to do it. But I I found um, myself um, with just fairly basic woodworking skills, being able to repair um, bamboo rods without too, too many tools, too much, too much trouble really, um, by accident. Um, I was spoiled. Uh, the third rod I built, I commissioned a rod um, uh, by Tom Morgan in um, about 2003. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't extend to a bamboo rod. They were 4,000 American dollars at the time. But I, I was able to, to um, correspond with Tom Morgan and he built me a six foot um, Sorry, a, a, a eight foot six, um, six weight, two piece, uh, which was a very, a very beautiful rod. So my third fly rod was built, and I didn't realise who Tom Morgan really was. I just thought I'll build, I'll buy a rod. This is my last fly rod I'll ever, ever buy, and um, it's a, it's a superb, superb piece of uh, machinery. So um, <clears throat> we'll just have a glass of beer. The other thing I think that um, happened to me, um, I, I've only ever been to one with Chrissy Kane, was the getting really um, in tune with what the rod's doing and how you're casting. And this um, lovely photograph um, uh, by um, Pierre Brandon is a, is a nighttime, um, almost um, staggered photograph of the forward cast. And you can see how that, how that it's, the arm's not going like this, it's actually pulling down, which actually keeps the tip of the rod straight. And it's, and um, Peter Hayes introduced this to me um, early this year and I, I went home and um, got the old Southam um, um, rod out and started doing this in the backyard. And I started hitting a, a stool 20 metres away quite accurately. And then I ended up winning the dry fly competition uh, with this old rod that was um, was done to fall apart. So the the connection between, I suppose, the design of rods, how they perform, whether it's graphite or, or bamboo, um, I don't think is, is is the issue. I mean, 
the reality is, is the graphite rods and uh, fiberglass rods fall apart. And, and uh, some bamboo rods are, are now into their second century that they're looked after. In terms of sustainability, they're, they're untouchable you know, from a design point of view. So, I mean, the design, the design of the rods that everybody's using, whether they're graphite or boron or um, fiberglass or bamboo, it's all, it's all connected in terms of design. And I call them the, 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 all, the, the best rod, fly rod you can have, I call it an all-dayer. Because if you're you on a fish all day, the last thing you want to do is come back. You have sore feet, but you don't want a sore arm. You want a rod that can cast a fish. It's hard enough to get a fly to a trout before it sees you anyway. So you really want an instrument that's going to do that, do that well. So lots, lots of variables. Um, the, um, you can see that, I mean, the, the parts are, um, are well known. They're, um, they all go together with, in terms of how they work, work together, starting off from the actual six pieces of, of, of cane, um, the blanks prepared, and then um, choices about real seats and, and Rod guides and silk and so on. So um, they're, the, they're the actual components. I've got some of those in boxes here, but it's probably too detailed. So, um, and then some of the tools in, involved in, in the process. I um, first first little rod that I started to restore the seven foot wandless, um, the 1950 rod. So it was, it was already 70, 71. Um, so it's it's older than the average age of the club members, which is quite, <laughs> quite good. It was a bit, and it took me, um, I mean, luckily I, I was inquisitive and I came across um, Jim Morris and, um, and Dave and they started to give me some, some um, advice, but it took me two hours to do the first silk, one silk binding with a silk through a book that wind you know, half of a rod ring on. Um, Oh, if you if you extrapolate that out to a, repairing a Philipson, which has got 160 silk changes, you end up you can't do it. So I ended up investing in a little um, Herter's cast cast iron um, silk um, contraption, which you basically um, put onto your bench and, and you can actually adjust the. I've got a little um, a little um, adjuster here with a yeah. You know, I'll pass it around, but um. So that was the first thing that I came across was to actually master the, the actual binding process to, to be able to actually do it reasonably, reasonably efficiently and reasonably accurately. You know, get the silk onto the, onto the actual rod guide and then pack it with a darning needle uh, till it's, till it's um, sitting pretty right and be able to tie it in correctly. And then of course, how do you, how do you seal the silk so it doesn't fall apart? Do you use, um, French polish, or do you use a, a, a fixer, and then and then the varnish to actually protect it because it's going to get wet. So that was the first. That's where I started. I took all the rings off the old wandless, and um, and went from there. And it was really a process of um, of um, I suppose you know learning learning by doing really. So the old wandless it was um, had a very sad grip. Um, I'd never done this before. I bought some cork, and um, Thought, okay, well, how do I get the cork on without having to pull the rest of it off? So I just split the cork down the middle and with some tight bond three glue, glued that back in and it started to work. And um, and I, I, I got the, the one list, um, brought it back to life. So there it is with its original silk, fairly you know, 70 years worth of mucking around. You can see some, you know, there's been some work here before, rings have changed, so, you know, Bit like um, 70, 71 year old, anything really. Uh, it had, um, um, it was tipped in felt pen. Somebody couldn't be bothered to do the, the silk in. So I, um, I researched um, silks and got the finest kimono silk and, and started to um, use that tool and then started to learn how to, how to bind and also uh, seal the silk so that it would last hopefully another 20 or 30 years. So somebody else didn't have to do it. So, and in, in the process, I also found the rod was, had splits. And so the traditional uh, method is to use white silk. And as soon as you hit it with varnish, 
it disappears, which is a really beautiful thing. So you can use you can do invisible uh, repairs with splits of split, splits of um, you know, splits in cane, and so the finished um, product you can just see. You might be able to just see a few little glints here. You see that that little um little line here. So that's all white silk running through to actually um, hold the rod together and keep it going for another another 50 years or however long the, um, the silk will last. And so that was my, really my first exercise was in ac accidentally um, fixing this old rod. In the process, I, I found myself taking photographs and texting and badgering these guys. And I've never had so much generosity in, in information coming back on how to do it. And so by June or July or August, I'd, I'd done the one list and then I started looking on eBay. <clears throat> I started to buy bamboo rods on eBay, and that was that was that was it. I was I was addicted, basically. Yeah, um, I'm afraid. Yeah. So mm. the rest of it's basically it's just some history. <laughs> <laughs> so the little the little I started getting interested in uh, mid-century Australian um, uh, rod makers, and William Southam from Sydney was making some very beautiful rods and. The rod that I somehow made um, that um, the competition um, was a little a little seven foot six um, three three weight sorry not three weight um, three ounce rod and it's um, it's got different silks on it it was falling apart it had splits on it and um, I ended up um, and it's got intermediate uh, silk bindings at every five eighths of an inch of the 300 intermediate bindings on this rod. It's totally mad. I mean, to not only split cane down into six pieces and then do 300 bindings on it, because the, because the glues weren't, um, weren't good enough. It's not quite put together. Anyway, well, I ended up putting a, a new uh, seat on it because it was broken. But that's the, that's the rod. Um, so it arrived in the tube, uh, it had um, silk falling apart, it had a pretty nasty split in it. Um, you can, if the split from a ferrule or from a tip is, is within about two inches, you can, you can cut that off and, uh, and, and repair it. So I, I used, uh, used the glues from the previous rod, um, bound them together and strung it up and put it back together. And, and put the ferrule back on, and that's the that's the rod. So I managed to repair that and get it going again. And then um, while I was casting that day at Salmon Ponds, I could hear this clicking noise, and got back home, and the um, all the cork in the in the grip had split, and the all the um, cane was falling apart in the actual um, in the grip. So I had to pull the grip off, uh, and um, found that it was actually a hollow built um, rod. And David Trevallia had given me an old um, Redditch rod. And I, got, I grabbed the tip of that rod and I put it inside the butt end and it fitted inside it. So I actually glued the tip end of another rod inside it. You can just see it in this photo. There's the tip end there to reinforce it because I was worried it was going to fall apart. So that is, this is now post-constructed um, seven, seven piece um, split cane, kind of mongrel really, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I bound that up and put the put a new reel seat back on it so I could use it as a as a fly rod. It's a really beautiful little rod. Uh, one tip, there's the shortest shorter tip. I couldn't match the silks, so I, I just put a classic um, garnet silk on it, and there it is. Lovely little rod, and there's Margaret Knight's um, we go. trophy, yeah. um, which was probably proved to be a fluke. I'll probably get cane next um, <laughs> oh, year. Um, I'll keep, I've got to speed up now because there's still a few more slides. If everybody's happy to keep going, is we, we like to keep going. So my next um, misdemeanor was like, then got Amer interested in American rods and bought this complete and utter wreck on eBay for 50 bucks. And it arrived and it was just, it was splits and <laughs> I really didn't know what I'd done. It was a heap of junk. Did you give him a bad review? Well, <laughs> he wrote back. And, he wrote back and said, "Send me some photos when it's finished." I'm going. Oh my god! So what happened with this rod? 
um, was that I, um, there you can see, somebody's taken all the rod rings off it and um, and it's split and completely wrecked. And it, look, I had to look at it for quite a long time. So I ended up um, writing off the mid, mid and, um, um, and tip sections. And I found that there was a tradition in American fly fishing to, to make Dante rods, which are like the bantam, out of out of the mid and tip sections of um, South Bend and um, so on. So what I did was I made another rod out of this rod. And this is actually the mid section. I fixed all the the splits actually. I embedded the split section in the in the um, in the handle and made a, a new six foot um, bandy rod out of that rod. In the meantime. Uh, I looked at this rod and um, decided that what I would do was buy a new uh, mid and, and tip section from Denver and faithfully put this, put this rod back together. So this became a nine foot rod. So I made two rods come out of the, out of the, out of the one rod. And so you can pass that around. And the basic thing with this is that the, the, um, the Philipson has um, Jasper black and white silk wraps and then gold, black and gold. So I researched where to get that and um, ended up having 160 silk changes to build this, to rebuild this rod. So you can, you can see the, um, see the silk on wrap and that just went around. around. So the, the, the difficulty with this, with this, this project, I'm now into kind of October, uh, was that once you start, you, you, you can't, what do you do? You either fix the rod or it goes into the garden as a, as a, as a you know, garden stack. So I ended up um, documenting what I'd done and got advice from, from um, um, people that know what they're doing. Uh, and so um, I just did a little chronicle of um, you know, tying in silk and uh, packing it and um, balancing it and, and then finishing it, cutting things off, packing it with a, with a um, burnisher and um, uh, fixing the, the color and then, and then varnishing. So that's the, that's the rod finished. It's, it ends up being a, um, a nine foot, um, probably seven weight, three piece, two tip uh, Philips and Paramount, built in about 1949 and crazily um, restored in um, 2000, and um, I think I'm not sure that I want to become a rod restorer, but um, I'm, I'm an accidental one. Uh, it's all right; they're pretty tough. So, out of the mid and tip section, the uh, the little banty six foot rod that's going around, it, it's the mid, mid and tip section of, of the same rod. It was in a wreck. I stripped it all off. Um, the tricky thing with um, with it. Uh, with varnish is how do you get the varnish off without taking off the, the surface. So I did a fair bit of research and, and each strip, it, it ends up becoming a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a trance, if you like. You've got to take the varnish off and get the light right so that you get down to the top, of, top surface of the cane, but don't not dig into the cane. And so I actually managed to strip, strip it's totally crazy, to take the, 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 all the varnish off it to then be able to refinish it into a um, into a rod that'll actually. Um, so, are you using any chemical or is it physical? I used a steel ruler, one I'm foot long. Scraper. It's like a it's like a big cabinet scraper, and just sat the um, the strips on the, the bench and just worked them very very carefully over a few hours, and turn it and do it again, and turn it and work up the rod, and then finish it off with um, the finest. Um, uh, steel wool, and then re-oiled it. Beautiful that going to some art stores who uh, specialise in removing varnish off old uh, masterpieces. Yeah, I, I, I have, but it'll probably cost a lot of money, so uh, <laughs> that's a possibility. So, um, you know, selecting a real student and um, putting the, um, the silk back on, it's a, it's a very classic um, rod with some, some nice pieces on it. Um, and I built that from a, a friend, uh, a Rawdon Goff, who I think is on is on Zoom. I don't know if he's still on Zoom. He might he might have decided it's 
that's too much. But um, so this is a very nice little six foot um, stream rod. And then the last rod um, I did was um, I came across um, Chapman Brothers in, in England um, who have um, been building um, bamboo planks for since about 1940, and I. I became quite enamoured with short rods. This is a six foot six pane, uh, 96 two piece, three weight, uh, and a really accurate rod for grasshoppering and, and stream fishing. And um, the blank, I think, is probably second to none in the world. So I, I spent quite a bit of money putting the best components on. This is the first rod I've built from, um, from blanks. That's my, my first new rod. I just add that you know for someone that's new to this, uh, Jim is this is very high standard work that he's doing. But you know, it takes most of us years to get to that sort of standard. Well, I think I've packed a fair bit of time into it. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. So um, you know, getting to know ferals, uh, how they work, all the real seed components, different types of stripping guides relative to the the kind of rod. It, it all becomes part of that. A kind of tectonic analysis to make the whole thing work as the one as the one piece, if you like. Um, how they're inscribed? Do you have, you know, hook keepers? Are they are they necessary? Where would you put them? What kinds of hook keepers? Um, so that's the six foot six um, blanks um, under construction. The little um, little piercels um, um, silk. I did a fairly faithful. Um, uh, cut, silk, silk colour job on this one um, with um, gold and um, a, a, a brown Java silk, and then the same process of packing and um, and finishing. Give me hundred bucks for that pain. So, mm -hmm. um, the real the, the stripping guide was was a hundred dollars. It's a very beautiful, um, <laughs> very beautiful um, um, yeah. <laughs> nickel silver with a white agate insert. Um, so again, I got myself into serious trouble here with um, the visa card. And so I suppose, yeah, then, and then really the real test is, um, is how does the rod perform? How does it, how does it work as, a, as an instrument, you know, extension of the body to cast, cast what is in effect a feather to, to a trout? So the first few trout I caught on a grasshopper in the Lake River during the Plessy Cane, uh, which um, was about, um, eight months after I'd started building. And then the third rod I hooked was um, was a six pounder at Lake Leek. Um, I only managed to get there for a couple of hours on the Saturday, got into Chock and Log Bay, and I know that fish come in there and, and um, do that circuit. Because I've, I've, um, I've missed them. I've, I've left a dry fly out for, for half an hour waiting for lunkers. And I missed a very big fish there one day. I was having a cigarette and, 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 and I missed the strike. And all I, all I could hear was the, the, the line moving in the reeds. And before I could, before I could gather the, the rod, it was gone. So um, I managed to get one back. Should have been watching Steve Yeah. So look, a lot of people involved in, in the process, the, the mentors and um, people who supply components all over the world, um, people that give you things. Uh, um, people, it's really crazy. Uh, and what what really happened was that all these photographs that I took to communicate and how to do this stuff, I, thought, I said to the Dave, well, let's, let's maybe do a presentation and share some of the experiences. And then I thought, well, maybe I should just make a make a website. So I found a um, a free website on Google one Saturday afternoon and um, had a crack at building a website. So um, that's um, that's pretty well where it's sitting. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks Fantastic. very much. Hi, James. Hi, Noel. Two things. Yeah. First of all, you've made a remarkable progress in the time. I think David's already mentioned that. The other thing you mentioned, you won the Margaret Knight Trophy and you didn't know whether you'd win the game. I was fortunate enough to win it once. God value the one you won very much. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to know Margaret. Okay. And uh, she was an absolutely beautiful person. 
Right. And uh, just absolutely loads of dried fly fish. Oh, great. I, I've rocked up at uh, in Jonah Bay and been the 13 foot dinghy and trying to make up my mind whether it was too rough to go up to the cow paddock. Margaret would come with a car and probably with her daughter with her. Backs a little dinghy in and hops in and threw the waves straight up to the cow paddock because it looked like being a done hat. But, uh, she just absolutely loved it and she loved the little. Courses for courses, really. Yeah. Mm. So, Chris, uh, you talk about the workmanship of, of cane rods and uh, the standard of rods. Uh, I think you made five glass too, Tom Morgan, did it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he used to, uh, used to own Winston, so he, he yeah. was involved in building a lot of the Winston rods. Uh, quality of rods, but you've never seen, you know, mm. stunning quality of rods. Yeah. David. Had an experience with the Lisa Michelle, the Barrow Club, and how would you rate them? Yeah, not a lot of experience. I mean, they, so the Pisa Michelle were uh, French designs with a shorter um, uh, butt section. So usually these sections are equal, but this range of rods were, uh, had a shorter butt section in terms of lining them up. And that does change the action of the rod. So uh, they're what we call a more parabolic. Yes. which is uh, really in, probably you think in terms of more fully bending. So the rod's bending, you know, right down, uh, down to the corks, really. 
Um, and I love horizontal work. There's different fields. You have to cast them more with late rotation, like a roll cast, where the later the better. And you need to pull, you need to pull the rod down, really force that rod to bend. But I love them, you know. I'm a paraholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Charles Roots called them a, uh, uh, I've forgotten it. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 I yeah. still have four of them, yeah, right. and I, but I've hardly used them. Yeah, really. No, yeah. Oh, that rate, that type of rod, that type of paper, <coughs> this sort of stuff with a floor at the press it came. Um, you know, very, just a different feel, you know, mm -hmm. and a different color. I, and I really love it. As opposed to, you know, the, the extreme graphite rod would be something like the Sage TCR, horrible rod, I think. And I don't mind some satisfaction graphite, but this is so stiff, this the TCR, that, you know, the tip, just the tip would bend. And they called it the TCR, the technical casting rod, because, <laughs> because to you know, keep that line straight was very difficult, you know, with a rod that didn't want to bend at all. So, with a fish on, you know, break it off pretty easy with those rods. And yeah, so I'm, uh, I'd love to see those rods though, the piece on. Right, love to. Mm. Well, bring, bring them in. Yeah, love to. Mm. Uh, David, what about the turbos? I've got four turbos. Mm. Yeah, okay. So that's so that that's a whole that's a whole area that we need to explore. The you know, the history of Australian bamboo rod builders. Mm. Um, I don't know much about them, you know. I know there was, help me out here, Jim, Turzel, mm. was it Carpenter and Son? Um, Southam and um, Butterworth. Yeah, but yeah. Butterworth. Butterworth, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we've got someone in the group, you know, the Cressley uh, group, that I understand is going to try and document it a bit more, but I don't know too much other than I think they got their blanks from Hardy, probably Chapman, or some of that. Yeah, they used a lot of um, hardy uh, components like real seats. But the turbo, it's they're pretty reasonable rods. I've repaired one, so, um, actual six two piece, maybe five or six weight. They'll so, cast a good line. So my understanding is they would be buying the blanks in and putting them together here. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think um, you know a lot of us are probably covered by using fairly old, heavy, maybe hardies or English. English rods that some of them had steel inside them as well. Yeah, yeah. Are really hard to cast and really not attuned to the kind of lightweight fishing that we're used to. Mm. But I mean, these rods uh, with the bamboo, if it's reasonable bamboo, it's either impregnated or it's been looked after. It, it's just, you can use it as a fly rod. Don't, mm. don't leave it gathering dust or. Mm. It might be gathering dust Nick said to me if everybody used bamboo fly rods, the temperature of the earth would drop exactly 1.5 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> now he's a math mathematician, wizard, so I'm not going to argue with him. Scott Morrison says something similar. <laughs> <laughs> the Hardy Crown out, and that was still standard, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I need my mate Jim Morris to answer that. Yeah. He's a mind I don't know, but sounds horrible. But Hardy also built a, a four foot four banty. You know, a lot of the a lot of the great makers built short rods as well as as the long. Oh, some, rods, uh, yeah, no, some of the hardy, some of the hardy uh, tapers are beautiful. You know? I mean, we we are locked into these heavier six, seven weights, nine foot, nine foot six. You know, and you know, they're, they're a bit ugly compared to an eight, nine foot graphite rod. But the Americans have always used shorter, tighter action cane rods. So. Um, you know, GEM skews used a Leonard rod, cane rod, didn't like the hardy rods, used a eight foot six, I think, a eight foot uh, Leonard rod. So, yeah, Americans have always been on to these shorter, lighter um, cane rods, which, which which we seem to follow their model rather than the British. Mm. Is that because of a lot of small river fishing? The Americans, mm. I think they've just got onto the material better, you know. I think they just uh, realise that if you cut a foot off a cane rod, it's easier to, and nicer to cast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and they, even their big rivers, you know, those big western rivers, they have to, you know, they wouldn't go beyond eight foot six. The mm -hmm. Gear Act rod, you know, the whole range is from eight foot six, John Gear uh, rods. Mm -hmm. 
think they're better at it. Mm. Anyway, it's pretty interesting to for people to hold these rods in the dark. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. Are there any more questions from the uh, and that deserves a round of applause. Yeah. Most yeah. Yeah. Right. So thank you all for coming. Um, I might just say, please be very careful leaving the venue because there are no lights. That's the obvious thing to say. Uh, but so if you make your uh, for those in Zoom, we actually lost our power, so uh, that's why. Uh, uh, we've gone to emergency uh, camera. So thank you very much for joining, uh, Bjorn, and we've got uh, Dan and someone else there. I might, I might just get um, James to um, say bye. Do you want to have a quick word to James? Do you want to say good day to those guys? Oh, they're still there. Yeah, yeah, still there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just swap the camera over. So we've got a live on you. Yeah, so sorry guys, we um we lost power here. Unfortunately, um we lost the lost the end of the um the talk, but hopefully it came across okay. It was great. Thank you, Jim. Thanks everyone. It was a, it was a fascinating night. Yeah. Thanks for thanks thanks for joining and uh said Fred Fred still there? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. I enjoyed it very much, James. It went absolutely splendid. Thank you. Um, now, are you guys, uh, you guys obviously do a bit of uh, fly tying as well. I don't myself, but uh, um, no, I just um, no, I just fish the damn things. I'm too, <laughs> I'm too old to start tying now. Uh, Riordan, do you uh, tie? I just I relocate them in willow trees mostly. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, thanks, thanks for joining, fellas, and um, uh, we'll, I'll end the meeting now so we can all get home out in the dark. No worries. Enjoy the after party there. It looks like you're kicking on. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> right. Really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. Great. Thanks, all. Bye. Thank, thanks very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.